Today is all about a smart trainer you may not have heard of before, and this is the Explova Noza S. According to the company profile, Explover started off operations in 2008 and were acquired by tech giant Acer in 2015. They're a Taiwan-based company specializing in cycling sensors, GPS head units, and this smart trainer. The Explover Noza S has been available for around 12 months now, and last November Explover sent one over for testing in the Llama lab. Before I get to those details, let's have a look at the technical specifications of this smart trainer. So the Explover Noza S is a direct drive interactive smart trainer with a very similar frame build to that of the Kicker Core, the Magin Gravat, and the Magin T100 trainers. Bike compatibility for this, we have Road 650 and 700C and mountain bike 24 and 26 with two height adjustments on the front leg on the unit. Axles, quick release and through axle out of the box. We have 12 by 142 and 148 supported and the adapters are included. Freehub is a Shimano SRAM compatible. No cassette is included with this trainer. Supported connections, Ant Plus, Ant Plus FEC and Bluetooth Smart. Transmitted over those data connections is power only. So we don't have cadence and we don't have speed. There's also control for sim mode and erg mode and things like that, but transmitted from the trainer is only power data. Power accuracy plus or minus 2.5%. Calibration is via a spin down. Grade simulation is up to 18% for a 70 kilo rider. So give or take based on your weight. Max wattage 2,500 watts. Flywheel 5.9 kilo flywheel. So quite a heavy flywheel. The noise level I would consider silent. Your drivetrain is gonna be a lot noisier than this trainer. Power source requires mains power and is firmware upgradable via their app. The price listed online for the Nosa S is £699 and around $1,200 Aussie dollars. So on feature sets and price, and almost the same form factor, this unit goes head to head with the Wahoo Kicker Core. Now we're 12 months down the track from the initial testing and feedback that I provided to Explover on this trainer. And there are a number of reviews rolling in that are covering a number of these updates based on my feedback. So I thought, what a better time to pull it off the shelf, install the latest update, and see how things have progressed. Getting straight into the detail today of my experience with the trainer, the feedback I've provided, and some of the resolutions that Explover have applied to this trainer over the last 12 months. Starting off with the overall ride feel. The Noza S feels very similar to that of a kicker trainer. Similar flywheel size, nice pedal stroke, doesn't feel like you're slogging into a headwind or up a hill all the time, so it has a good ride feel to it. So there's a tick there from me. The Noza S is very, very quiet, almost silent in operation. Your drivetrain will be a lot louder, and if you've got fans on cooling you down in that pain cave, the trainer will be drowned out by those, no problems at all. So sound is a tick. The responsiveness to simulated gradient changes has been greatly improved over the last 12 months. Initially, there was a two or three second lag, and it really felt disconnected riding through Titan's Grove with what I was feeling on the pedals. That has been resolved. It is super fast to change, and that was using Bluetooth on Windows and Zwift. The spin down is only via their app, and there's still no in-game spin down on Zwift, which means you have to go to the pairing screen, disconnect everything, open their app, perform the spin down, go back to Zwift, repair, and away you go. We'll look more into why spin down is important in a moment, but that's still not fixed. Bit of a pain point there. Sprinting at 0% gradient was really easy to spin up and almost get over top of the gear way too fast. Outside, if you're riding a bike, you're in the 53, say 15, it takes a lot more time to spin up that gear and get on top. On the Noza S, it was really, really quick to get on top of it and spin out. Possibly related to the internal gearing or the gear ratios of the flywheel, but something that's not fixed on this unit probably can't be fixed via software. Also related to sprinting is the power accuracy during sprints. It's way, way too high. You'll see that in a moment. That hasn't been resolved with the latest firmware update. Erg mode on the Noza S was originally reporting only set point wattage, meaning if you were to set it to 200 watts erg, that's all it would report. 250, that's all it would report. Very digital and fake watts, I would call them. They've now fixed that with an option to toggle smoothing on or off, very similar to what Wahoo do with their units. The cadence reporting at zero RPM, well, that's still taking place. If you were to pair this unit as a smart trainer controllable and a cadence sensor, the cadence being zero means you would start moving along and not pedaling. It looks like you're on a motorbike. At this price point, they really need to do cadence on the trainer itself or throw a cadence sensor in the box. Explover make those kind of sensors. They should throw one in if they can't do it on the trainer. And last on my list of observations here is the unit emits an audible beep every 60 seconds around the clock, even when not in use. I had a hell of a time trying to figure out what was making that noise in the Llama lab during my testing. And it turns out around the clock, 24 seven, without fail, you'll hear a So you've got to turn this thing off at the wall. Now there's no reason for the unit to do that. The unit should go to sleep and completely shut off. But if you've got one of these units and you're hearing a it's not your fire alarm. 
It was good to see a number of those early issues reported resolved in firmware, but this unit still has a number of hangups that you need to know about. And a lot of those raised their head within the extensive Llama Lab testing over the last week, and that was over three rides. First up, the Llama Lab test, which is a comprehensive test looking at power reporting or accuracy, sim mode and erg mode performance, sprints, noise levels, and data quality. Then it was onto a Zwift group ride, which was a sim mode test with some race efforts at the end. And then it was onto Elta Zwift, which I would call an extreme sim mode test or thermal testing of the unit, which you'll see in a moment. Here we are again on my favorite website on the internet, the DCR analysis tool, where we can compare multiple power meters as an overlay and see how they stack up. Llama lab test first up with quite an extensive warm up of this training. You'll see why in a moment. Finishing off there with just over a minute or two at around 400 to 450 watts. A spin down was then performed within their application because you can't do a spin down within Zwift. Then it was on to the testing protocol. So testing the Explovenosa S up against the Powder Max and Gico and the Vector 3s were on the bike as well. So into 200 watt steady state, 250 watt steady state, and all is looking really, really good. The power numbers coming from the Nosa S are still quite smoothed with the smoothing turned off, but you can see there, 223, 225, 227, all within a few watts, all looking really good for that particular section. So easily passing the Llama Lab test for the 200 and 250 watt steady state. Into the sprints, and no, it overshoots the sprints by quite an amount here. So peaking at 1566, where the other two are peaking at around 1250. So not quite there on the sprints. Over reporting, which isn't uncommon in reviews of this trainer. Into the overs and unders, and again, close, but still no cigar in regards to say plus or minus 2.5% accuracy. So you can see here at the lower level, a little better. Up, when it kicks in, pretty smooth I would call it. So it's not really waving over and under quite a lot once it finds that set point, but still reporting a little under and still very smooth in the data. So very close, but not quite right with those 350 and the 450 efforts there in the overs and unders. The time taken to change between low and high and high to low is still pretty quick within a second and a half. So that's not a problem at all for responsiveness in ERG, but the power accuracy is a little bit off. The next part I'll dive into is the flywheel speed test within ERG mode. So the set point is 225 watts. I start off in the slowest flywheel speed and then I progressively change into a harder gear and really spin that flywheel up. We get to the 5311 if that's what's on the bike. Things typically fall apart there for trainers. That's not the working zone for them in ERG mode but we see how things hold up. So first of all here, really slow flywheel speed, and you can see the Nosa S is unable to provide 225 watts of resistance. It provides more resistance. So around 240 watts or so at 225 in a slow flywheel speed. Now I can't tell you exactly what flywheel speed that is because it doesn't report speed from the unit. This section here is with a slightly higher flywheel speed, and you can see the power accuracy really coming into play there and the ERG mode is able to hold the correct 225 watts. And this section here, I put it in the 5311, get that flywheel spinning up screamingly fast. Things typically fall apart here. Trainers aren't designed to be used in ERG at 225 watts with a massively high flywheel speed. And you can see it's unable to hold those, uh, those zones there and the power accuracy goes out. The two power meters on the bike are happy. Um, they're reporting correct wattage, but the NOSA is not providing that wattage and resistance. From there, I change up a gear, slow the flywheel down, and then change up a gear, slow it down again, and see where things come into line. You can see here I change gear here, it's getting closer. I change gear again, slow the flywheel down, getting closer, change up again, and things come into line. At around the 53, I think that was probably the 19 on the back, indicating that the 5319 at that wattage and that cadence is probably the limit for this trainer to be accurate in ERG. So what we can tell from here is the Nosa S doesn't like a really slow flywheel speed for ERG and it doesn't like a really fast flywheel speed for ERG. Somewhere around the middle, maybe the 39, say 15 on the back, you'll be good to go. And as part of my cool down, I did a short little test just in sim mode on the flat road. And you can see here the Nosa S just under reports this little part here as I slowly ramp up. And then as I start pushing on the pedals a little harder, a little more consistently, almost over reports through here. We get a better visual indication of what's going on in the next data set. And speaking of the next data set, this is the Aussie Hump Day ride. Every Wednesday night, an easy mid-pace ride, I guess you'd call it, for around 40 minutes, and then it's on. It's the race lap or race laps. Okay, so we had the Nosa S up against the Powder Max NGCO. I also had the Vector 3s on the bike, but I'm just showing the NGCO here for simplicity. And we can see early on, things look pretty good. 
So the uh, nose of S is probably spiking a little higher here and here and here in the harder efforts in here, but that tends to be towards the later part of the ride. So speaking of which, the later part of the ride, which is the race section through here, and looking at the numbers down the bottom, 350 versus 334, the nose of S is over-reporting in power. And you can see where. Steady state efforts through here, the spikes through here, here, definitely through here, and again up through here. This is unsmoothed, so it is a little spiky, but you can see the trend there. The nose of S is over-reporting once we're about 47 minutes to an hour into the ride. So there's no smoothing at all on the data. If we switch over to five minute smoothing, which is quite extreme, you'll see exactly what's going on with the trainer here. So early on, the nose of S is reporting under power, under power, under power, and at around 22 to 23 minutes, it flips and starts reporting a little higher, comes into line, and then from then on, it's consistently out, consistently reporting over, and then as soon as the ride gets a little harder, things get a little hotter, it reports even higher than the Powder Max NGCO. So you can see there quite a separation with the five minute uh, smoothing as things go down. Even in the cool down lap when things are still quite hot, it's still over reporting through here. Comes into line down here as the effort backs off and then still reports over there. So it appears that the unit takes around 22 to 23 minutes to warm up. And even then it starts to over report. I'm guessing this is probably the temperature that it was calibrated at. And then from there, as things get hotter and hotter and hotter, the power numbers just start to separate even more and more and more. A good way to test the thermal drift of a trainer is to take it up Elk Zwift. An hour of climbing is gonna put anything under a lot of stress. Here's the data from that unsmooth. So early on, very early on, you can see there the trainer is under-reporting by quite a lot up against the NGCO. And then as soon as we hit the climb, again under-reporting, and it comes good then it flips the other way. You can see it's over-reporting here near the end. And if we flip that to, again, the five minute smoothing, same trend as we're seeing before. So under-reporting at the start, at around, well, surprise, surprise, 25 minutes, it equals the power meter on the bike. That all looks good. And then from there, as things get further along and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter, at around the same effort, the power starts increasing and increasing and increasing. So this has a major issue with thermal drift. If you're wondering how I know it's the trainer that has the thermal problem and not the NGCO, well, if I pull up the Vector 3, we see exactly the same issue. The Vector 3s are consistent with my effort and the trainer just keeps growing and growing and growing in the power reported. My takeout from that data analysis is that it's very, very difficult to get accurate power from a smart trainer. You've got to factor in heat, flywheel speed, resistance applied, and get that right across a number of different riding conditions. And Explover just aren't there yet with this trainer. Okay, almost time to wrap this one up and onto my summary of this unit. Has a good ride feel, just riding along, turning the pedals in sim and in erg mode. Silent operation is fantastic. Your drivetrain and your fans will be louder than this trainer. Excellent sim mode response time through Titans Grove using Bluetooth to Windows and Zwift. Those hills poured the resistance on and off as you'd expect. The power numbers with the right gear, the right flywheel speed, and the right temperature were good. You saw the 200 watts and 250 watt steady state right on the money there for power. Everything else, not quite. That takes me to the flip side. So power accuracy, that was a roller coaster, a thermal roller coaster from hell. The overshoots in sprints and harder efforts, they're a showstopper. You would not be using this to record your Zwift races or you'd be accused possibly of cheating. No cadence is a bit of a problem with this unit. They need to throw a cadence sensor in the box or come up with a firmware that calculates cadence based on that power curve. No calibration within Zwift, that's an overhead of being an owner. If you were to use one of these units and have to calibrate the unit and given the thermal drift, you need to calibrate this unit quite a lot. You have to unpair all your sensors, open their app, do the calibration, go back into Zwift, repair your sensors or whatever software you're using. That's an overhead that should not be there. This thing should be calibratable from any software that you use. That audible, every 60 seconds needs to go. It's very, very annoying if you're in the same room as this trainer, trying to figure out what the hell that noise is. So they just need to switch that off when not in use. Look, ultimately where this unit is positioned in the market, which is up against the Kicker Core and the Elite Suto for price, it just can't compete with on features. Remembering the Suto comes with a cassette, comes pre-assembled and comes with Cadence. So the Core and the Suto are gonna be better options than this trainer here at that price. I really hope Explover are working on version two of the Noza with the learnings from this one. This is their first direct drive smart trainer. This one is a little behind the competition. Okay, we'll leave it there for today. Hopefully you found this video informative. I do like to dig down the rabbit holes on the technical details of these trainers because I think it's important to know exactly what you're getting if you're spending good money on a smart trainer. 
As always, to support this channel, click subscribe. To take that support a little further, click that member button. It's much appreciated. Thanks for watching.